You looking good? You looking good? Hey, my name is Jason. I'm the pastor here at the church and just pumped that you're here. Just want to echo what John and Kristen said. It's a big deal that you're here, whether this is your first time or your 50th time. Uh, we're just glad that you're here. We're better together. So thanks for being here. Um, at the end of service today, please don't rush out because at the end of the service today, we're going to have a special time of prayer blessing over all of our students and teachers and teacher's assistants and school secretaries and bus drivers and everybody uh, with the school year. So that's going to be that's going to be good. Don't rush out of here at the end because we're going to have a special time of prayer. OK. On May 25th, 1979, a man named Dennis Whitley or Watley was waiting to catch a flight from Chicago to Los Angeles uh, for a speaking engagement. He was running late. And so doing what you do when you run late in an airport, he's full sprinting through the O'Hare airport and he gets to gate K5 just as they closed the jetway. They won't let him on the plane. He begs, he says, listen, you got to let me on. I'm a, I'm a guest speaker at an event. I've got to get to Los Angeles, but they don't budge. And so he's angry. He turns around. He goes back to the customer desk, the customer help desk. There's a long line, he gets in line, he's prepared to, to leave a complaint, to talk to a manager uh, that they wouldn't let him on the plane. He stands there 20 minutes, the line has not budged. When he hears an announcement come over the intercom that says American Airlines flight 191 from Chicago to Los Angeles had crashed upon takeoff. 258 passengers and 13 crew members had died. It was the deadliest U.S. aviation accident in U.S. history. And so Watley got out of line. He didn't register a complaint. In fact, he didn't even return his ticket or ask for a refund. He took it home. And to this day, on the bulletin board above his desk is that ticket. It's pinned there. And he put it there to remind him to live life. He put it there to remind him himself that he was lucky to, to be alive. So let me ask you a question this morning as we get started. How would you live differently if you knew you should be dead? Now, some of you in the room, like you can literally answer that question because you've told me your story. You're like, I should be dead, bro. Like I, I was driving that car that went around that tree. I was like in that place. Like I should be dead. You've told me your story. But for the rest of us, how would you live differently if, if, you knew or if you knew that you should have died or should be dead, but you are alive? How, how would you live differently? Let me, ask it this way. Let me ask it this way. If God gave you another chance, if God gave you another chance, what would you do differently? For the next three weeks, uh, I'm going to be teaching a series called Meant for More. Everybody say Meant for More. And we're going to read three stories in the Bible. These are three stories in the Gospels out of the life of Jesus. And, and, and these stories are a little bit different than your typical Bible stories. I don't know where you went to church or what school you went to, but I would be willing to bet that if you were taught the Bible growing up, I'd be willing to bet that you were not taught necessarily these stories because they're, they're a little more difficult to deal with. And what makes them so different is that these stories that we're going to read, here's the deal. Jesus comes across a little bit mean. Like, for real, we, we have this picture of God. He's like this kind of long-haired Matthew McConaughey. He's like this, you know, like, all right. Like, he's turning water into wine. He is just kind of chilling, fun-loving guy. And, and, and we have this concept weeks. And the three stories that we're going to read from the Gospels over the next three weeks, they don't really fit that guy. Yeah. It has an intensity to it. These stories have a little teeth to them. Like, like Jesus has a little edge to him in these stories. And I'm just giving you a warning. Like he comes across a little bit, a little bit mean. See, Jesus, the Bible says that he is full of grace, like 100% full of grace. And he is. He's this gracious, loving, chance after chance, patient God. He, he is that. The, and we sing these songs growing up like, Jesus loves me, this I know. And that is true. He does. 
But the Bible also says that he is full of 100% truth, that he's full of grace and he's full of truth, which means that not only is he this gracious, patient, loving, chance after chance God, he's also full of truth, which means that he's constantly challenging you and me to close the gap between where we are and where we could be. You, You tracking with me there? That God is, he's convicting, pressing, nudging, whispering, knocking on our hearts constantly to close the gap between where we are and where we could be. And so the song that you sang is true. Jesus does love you, but he loves you too much to let you stay where you are. And so he, and so he's, he's just pushing and nudging and knocking on your heart to close to close the gap. And that's what this series is all, is all about. Th- this series is about, is about what we do because we're saved. Not what we do to be saved. To be saved is a gift of God, a gift of faith through salvation. And so just to be clear, over these next few weeks, we're not going to be talking about what you need to do, some extra requirement for God to love you or for God to save you. That is not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is what we do because we're saved. Love us. We do because God loves us, not so that he will love us. And so we're going to use these stories. Jesus is going to have a little intensity to him. I'm going to have a little bit of intensity to me. And we're going to use these stories to close that gap between where we are and where we could be with God's help. When we invite Jesus Christ into our lives, when we decide to, for him to be in charge and to be the savior of our lives, it is intended to uh, infiltrate and permeate every part of our lives. That, that Christian moms and dads should be different than other moms and dads. Christian bosses should be different from other bosses. Christian employees should be different from other employees, Christian teachers, Christian students, Christian coaches. They should be better, not because we're better than everybody else, but because we're better than ourselves now that we have Jesus, right? In 2 Corinthians, Paul was writing and he said, God has given us this gift of Jesus to make us right with God. And then he says, so don't ignore it. He says in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 1, he says, don't take this gift that God has given you and just put it to the side and ignore it. Like, oh, I prayed this prayer one time at this camp, and so I'm a Christian. Yeah, technically may be true, but he says, no, don't ignore it. Let that faith in Jesus infiltrate every part of your life, every part. And Jesus said that he came so that we would have life mediocre. That's not what he said. Some of you are like, he did? No, 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 he didn't say that. He said, I came that so that you would have life to the what? To the full. He said, I want you to have life maxed out, life to, to the full. So we're not going to ignore it. We're not going to put it to the side. We're going to figure out with God's help, with his grace and with it be, or not how to close the gap between where we are and where we could be. We're not going to settle because we... We were meant for more. We were meant for more. So today we're going to look at a story in Luke chapter 13, verse 6. If you have a Bible, I would love for you to read along. I think it just kind of does something to read along. It can be on your phone. If you don't have a Bible or it's not on your phone, it'll be up on the screen for you. You can read along with us there. But Luke chapter 13, excuse me, verse 6. I'm going to meet you there in just a second. All right, I'm going to meet you at Luke 13 in a second. But while you're finding it, I want to read another story to you. You don't have to find this one. I'm just going to read it to you. But this is a story about Jesus in Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11. While you're finding Luke 13, I'm going to read you Mark 11. Here's what it says. It says, the next morning as they were leaving, talking about Jesus and the disciples, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. It's just encouraging to me to know that I'm becoming more and more like Christ because I'm always hungry. So like I'm just being like Jesus. And he noticed a fig tree in full leaf a little way off. So he went over to see if he could find any figs. But there were only leaves because it was too early in the season for fruit. Then Jesus said to the tree, may no one ever eat your fruit again. And the disciples 
heard him say it. Skipping down to verse 20 in Mark 11, it says, The next morning, Jesus and the disciples passed by the fig tree that he had cursed. Some of you guys are like, man, Jesus cursed? Like, wow, I'm, I'm becoming like Jesus too, Jason. Like, wow. Uh, he says, no, he kind of, he, he told it to die, right? It says, they come by the tree that, that he had cursed, and the disciples noticed that it had withered from the roots up. And Peter remembered what Jesus had said to the tree the previous day, and he exclaimed, look, Rabbi, the fig tree you cursed has withered and died. Now, now here's an example of mean Jesus I was talking about, right? This doesn't sound like something that Matthew McConaughey Jesus would do, right? This doesn't sound like what like hippie Jesus water to wine Jesus would do. Like, why has he got to be so mean to the growing yet? And so I'm sure there was a good reason. Like the Bible said it wasn't exactly the season of growing yet. And so it sounds like he was being a little bit unreasonable. This doesn't sound like something that Jesus, like we know, would do. But there is an incredibly powerful principle in this story that me and you need to hear today. And the principle is this, that you need to curse the barren fig trees in your life. You need to curse the barren, the, the barren fig trees in your life. That there are things, relationships, habits, and jobs in your life, hear me, they are not producing. They're not producing. And there comes a point, if we're following the example of Jesus, there comes a point where you curse it and you let it die. So knowing how Jesus feels about fruitless fig trees, now let's read from Luke chapter 13, starting with verse six. Here's what it says. It says, then Jesus told this story, a man planted a fig tree in his garden and came again and again to see if there was any fruit on it. But he was always disappointed. Finally, he said to his gardener, I've waited three years and there hasn't been a single fig cut it down. It's just taking up space in the garden. Stop for a second. Now, before we read any further, it's really important that you don't miss this point, okay? We read the story about Jesus cursing the barren fig tree. And now we read a story that Jesus is telling. It's a fictional story. It's a parable. But we read the story that Jesus is telling about a man who's upset that his tree isn't producing fruit. So we need to stop and pick up on the fact that Jesus obviously has an expectation that things is clear now to produce fruit, be fruitful, right? Right? This is clear now, obviously, that Jesus' expectation is, if you're supposed to be fruitful, when I inspect, I want to see some fruit. This is what Jesus is saying, right? So, 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 so Jesus, not Matthew McConaughey Jesus, other Jesus that has a little bit of intensity to him, is frustrated. He's bothered by this concept, by this idea that, that, that things that are supposed to be fruitful would not be fruitful. Now, this idea goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. I don't know how familiar you are with the story of Adam and Eve, but all the way back, beginning of time, matter of fact, the first conversation to ever happen between God and people, God looks at Adam and Eve and he says to them, be what? Fruitful. Be fruitful and multiply. Now here, listen, like literally he was talking about having babies. Okay. He, he was talking about having babies. All right. But the principle is still true. Here's the principle. If you're going to be in relationship, have something to show for it. That's the principle. The, the principle is like, like, I want you to produce something. That's what Jesus was saying to the first man and woman who ever lived. Like, listen, if y'all going to be together, let's produce something. Okay. And so this idea of being fruitful has been around, has been around really forever. But Jesus didn't just say, be fruitful and multiply. He added like one more little phrase onto the end of be fruitful and, uh, and multiply. It's in Genesis chapter one, uh, verse 28. Here's what it says. It says, and God blessed them, talking about Adam and Eve, be fruitful, multiply. We know that part. He says, and replenish the earth and subdue it. 
and subdue it, right? That's kind of like a Bible way to say something. What does that mean? And subdue it. Now, I don't want to go like too nerd, geeky, like down deep here uh, on, on it. And Old Testament was written in a Hebrew language. We read it in English, which means they had to translate it. And every word is not a perfect translation. So they've got to kind of group words together or find the best fit in order for us to read it in English. Does that make sense to everybody? So you can find words in English, trace them back to the original language that they were written in, and you can get more of the intention or the intent of what the author was trying to say. Does that make sense? So if you go back and read Genesis 128 in the original Hebrew, which I can't do, but somebody else did and I read what they said, all right? If you go back and read that, Jesus said, be fruitful, multiply, all right? He said, replenish the earth and subdue it. And subdue in Hebrew is kabosh, kabosh, right? Now, kabosh is, is a word that's like a, it's like a military term. It's really, it's a fighting term. It's really kind of like a martial arts term. And the best translation that we can get for the word kibosh, you ready for this? You're going to love this, is like a chokehold. Okay. Are you following me? So, so he says subdue it, which was originally kibosh it. And kibosh it means put a chokehold on it. Okay. So follow this. This is so fantastic. So God says to Adam and Eve, be fruitful, multiply, go out into the world and put a chokehold on it. Okay? This is what God said to the first man and woman to ever live. He said, here's the precedent. Produce something and put a chokehold on life. He wants you to dictate the terms to life, not life to dictate the terms to you. He wants you to go beast mode on life. He wants you to be in charge of life and stop letting life happen to you, but he wants you to happen to life. So is the goal of your life to get to the weekend? Like, oh, if I could just get to Friday, like I just got to get to Friday. <laughs> Friday night for a margarita to get to the lake. Is the goal of your life to just make it to Elno Paul on Friday night for a margarita? It's the goal of your life, just 51 weeks of work, so I can just please, I just got to get to the beach. I just got to stick my toes in the sand. Hear me, nothing wrong with any of those things. Nothing. Unless it's the highlight of your life. Unless it's what you look forward to more than anything else. Then it's a problem. Because you have no life. And God wanted you to have life to the full. And if the fullest that your life gets is the lake and a margarita, I feel bad for you. Because God wants you to put a chokehold on life. So what are you living for? How much gap is there between where you are and what you know you could be and what you know God has put in you? And where, and where are you settling? So maybe you're in a financial hole so deep, you, you, you swear you're never going to get out right? Hear me. With all the compassion and love I have in my heart, it's time for you to start being the boss to your money right. instead of your money being your boss, right. right? Will it be easy? No, it will not. But God created you for more than monthly payments. He wants you to put a chokehold on life. Maybe, maybe you are uh, addicted to a drug or a substance and it is kicking your tail. It's time for you to go on the attack and to put a chokehold on that addiction. Will it be easy? No, it will not. But will it be worth it? Yes, it will. Maybe it's your marriage, your career, your kids. Your faith, listen to me. Stop letting life dictate the terms. Be fruitful. Put a chokehold on it and be in charge. Live up to your God bigger than what your self potential. God's plans and dreams for your life are way bigger than what you're settling for. Way bigger. You're like, okay, you convinced me. How do I do that? That's a fantastic question. 
And for the last 10 minutes, I want to give you like the simplest Bible lesson you've ever heard in your life. We're going to finish the story. We read Luke, 16, or Luke 13, excuse me, verses 6 and 7. Now go back. If you still have your Bible, your phone, go back. We're going to read verses 8 and 9. So remember, just to recap, the, the man planted the tree, didn't get it, didn't get any fruit, been three years. He says to the gardener, cut it down. Verse 8, the gardener answered, Sir, give it one more chance. Don't you just love compassionate, soft people in life? Like, come, just come on. Don't be so hard on the tree. You know, that's how my mom was. She ruined me. You know, it's like, just come on. Just, you know, type A people want to see production, cut it down. Then there's everybody else. It's like, it's okay, right? He says, sir, just give it one more chance. Leave it another year, and I'll give it special attention, plenty of fertilizer. And if we get figs next year, fine. If not then you can cut it down. Now, listen, every now and then, okay, every now and then, I always preach from the New Living Translation, not because it's better than other ones. I just like it more. So I always preach from the New Living. But every now and then, there are these verses in the Bible that if you go back and read them from the King James, it just preaches better. So I'm going to do that today, all right? So I want to go back. Some of y'all, y'all have never even read the King James. You're like, what's the King James? It's like, a, it's like a Shakespeare version of the Bible. It's crazy hard to read. I'm not recommending it, but this is how my grandfather read it and preached it. So I'm going to go here. Luke 13, verses 8 and 9. In the King James translation, this is what it says. It says, And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit, well, that's how I've always read it. I don't know. Just, that's all he says, well. And if it bear fruit, well, cut it down. Right? Then after that, thou shall cut it down. You ready? I got eight minutes and 21 seconds for the simplest Bible lesson you've ever heard in your life. Dig it, dung it, cut it. <laughs> Dig it dung it, and cut it. That's my challenge to you today. As we identify areas in our life that aren't producing like we wish they were or we know they could be, what do we do? Number one, here we go. We dig it. We dig it. For some of you today, the answer for your areas of life that aren't producing, that isn't living up to what you know it could be or should be or what God would have it to be, for some of you, the answer is you need to dig about it. You need to dig about it. Now, I had to do some research this week about um, plants and digging because I am not what you would call a green thumb. Uh, and the process of digging around something that isn't growing is intended to soften the soil or to, to turn the soil. In other words, if something isn't growing, you dig around it so that you're able to get new resources to the roots, okay? So when it comes to your life and the areas of your life that you feel stuck or are not producing, okay, maybe you need to turn the soil a little bit. What do I mean by that? Maybe you need to dig into some new resources, it's easy to assume that things will just get better in life if you'll just wait long enough, but that's not true. That's a myth. If you don't do something about your body, you will get fatter and more out of shape every time. You don't accidentally end up with a good body, good kids, a good marriage, good money. Like Things don't accidentally happen in life. It takes intentionality. So if you're somewhere right now in life, and you're like, man, I wish it was better. I'll just wait. That ain't going to work. You got to be intentional about it right? You gradually drift toward complacency. Guys, this is going to be life-changing, so you need to turn the soil. Now, some of you guys, this is going to be life-changing, and it's actually pretty simple. Like, the digging is the, is the easiest of the three options, because all you need to do today is to make a decision to put in more effort. Like, you just got an effort problem. Stop settling. Increase the effort level in the areas of your life that need to start producing again. Maybe more effort in your marriage looks like counseling appointments. You may need to go to counseling because you're in a terrible place. You may need to go to counseling because you're not in a bad place. You just know you could be in a better place. And that's what effort looks like. Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's reading a marriage book together. And some of you guys are like, I don't read. I know you don't read. That's why I'm talking about digging and putting in more effort. 
You, I agree with you. I know you don't read. So put in some effort. Get the audio book. Have her read it out loud to you. I mean, what, what, what do we got to do here? Let's turn the soil a little bit. Order the DVDs. Like, I, just do something to, to put in a little bit of effort. Maybe it's setting up bi-weekly date night with your spouse, designating some money for child care. Not at mom and dad's house where you got to go pick them up. No, you're going to pay somebody to come to your house. And the reason you're paying somebody to come to your house is so when you get home, the kids are in bed. Because you know what happens when you get home and the kids are in bed? You make more babies, okay? Now, that may have deterred you from childcare. That's not what I meant. But if you get home and you've been, you've been, you know, there's been a spark to the night and then you get home and then your three-year-old just pooped down his leg and, and you walk in the door and that's what meets you, flame is gone. And you know what I'm talking about? It's gone, okay? So we're going to pay a babysitter with specific instructions. I want the kids in the bed. I, and when you, okay, and lock the door if you have to. I just, just get them in there. And when you see me pull in, you go out the front door, all right? Because we're going to put in some effort, okay? We're going to turn the soil a little bit, all right? Maybe that's what it looks like. Some of you guys are like, man, you should have led with that, not the reading the book thing. I don't even... Listen, speaking of budgets, maybe effort in your finances looks like signing up for a Financial Peace University class, cutting up credit cards, writing down your first budget. And some of you guys are like, yeah, I tried a budget one time. It didn't work. I know. That's why we're talking about it right now. Turning the soil, softening the soil, putting in the effort, trying again, trying again. We, you are in a church filled with some brilliant financial people. And you know what I know about them? They'd love to like, go to coffee with you and just like help you. Like they get a kick out of it. Don't ask them for money. They want to help you, right? So maybe that's what effort looks like. Listen, we could keep giving examples. We could talk about your faith. Maybe you need to commit. I'm not going to miss church for the rest of the year, no matter what. No matter what opportunities present themselves, no matter what the weather's like, I'm going to dig into my faith because I want to see it grow. So I'm not going to miss church the rest of the year. Maybe it's joining a small group, a serve team, starting a Bible plan. We could keep going and going and going because there are all kinds of examples. When there are things in your life that grow stagnant, sometimes you just need to dig in a little bit, put in a little effort. Let me, can I just tell you one more thing real quick? One more thing about digging. I love what the guy said, the gardener said to the guy, he said, give it a year. He put a deadline on it because a goal without a deadline is just a wish. So put a deadline on it. You're never going to accomplish anything great in your life without guidelines, deadlines, and butts on the line. That's what it takes to accomplish something great in your life, right? I just did this. I'm not, I'm, I'm not telling you to do something I don't do myself. We were on the plane to Guatemala. I, in my prayer journal, I was thinking about a few things that I knew I needed to do, but I didn't want to do. And so two pages ago in my prayer journal, you could see, and the future me will think. I wrote down this phrase, things I don't want to do that I need to do, and the future me will thank me for doing. That's what I wrote at the top of my paper. And I wrote down six things, and they're annoying, and they're hard, and they're time-consuming, but I need to do them. And beside each one, I put a deadline, because if I didn't put a deadline, I wouldn't do it. I gotta fill out paperwork, I gotta go to this office, I gotta do this, I'm putting a deadline on it. So he said, look, let's give it a year. This is not open-ended, we're gonna give it a year. And then we'll check it out. So some of you in the room, you need to put a deadline on something. Something you've been thinking about doing for years, put a deadline on it. Put in the effort, and then let's see, let's see what happens, okay? So what do you need to dig into? What area of your life do you need to turn the soil? That's what digging is. So some of you, you need to dig. It's an effort thing. But for some of you, it's not just about effort. It's not just about digging. For some of you in the room, you got to dung it. You got to dung it. Dung means exactly what you think it means. It's fertilizer. And I don't know why God chose to make the, the, the best ingredient for growth manure, but he did. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's one of those things when you get a chance to, like, talk to God. You're like, God, a couple of things I've always wondered about. Why is manure the greatest ingredient for growth? It could have been, like, Febreze. You know what I mean? Spray a little Febreze on it. Psh, there it goes. Nope. Manure. 
in all seriousness, though, can I tell you something that's so true? You want to grow? Deal with the crap in your life. Like there are things in your life that you've been ignoring because they stink and they smell and they're messy and you just keep pushing them to the side and you wonder why you keep going in circles or you're not growing or nothing's happening. You got to deal with the crap. You got to deal with it. Nothing grows your life like manure. Nothing grows your life like fertilizer. Those are what make you grow. You, have you ever gone to a movie that was like two hours long? Nope, never knob and always did his taxes and never got arrested. And when the movie was over, his kids were happy. Nope, never not once. Because every movie you enjoy has adversity and trial and trouble. And you've got to fight through something. And you've got to work through something. But we don't want to do that. And we wonder why we don't grow. We've got to dig into it. Maybe it's a hard conversation. No, it probably is a hard conversation, honestly. A conversation where you need to forgive. Maybe it's a conversation where you need to confess. Maybe it's dealing with issues from your childhood that you've ignored because it's too painful. I, I did this the other day. Andrea said to me, like, just kind of debriefing what was, she's like, hey, what are you doing today? I was like, I'm going to see my counselor. She's like, What? you haven't been to your counselor in years. I was like, I know, I just made an appointment because I realized the other day when this guy was talking to me that I had, I had some stuff happen to me in middle school. Like not crazy, like awful stuff, but like something that happened, some things that happened in middle school that I never realized. I'm not trying to get psycho babble on you here, but like I never realized how much they affected me. And this guy the other day when I was at this meeting in Atlanta said something and all of a sudden like, this rush of like, oh my gosh. And I just need to talk about it with somebody. And it's stinky and smelly and it brings up insecurities, but that's how you grow. That's how you grow. So some of you in here, like you got issues with your mom and dad and you just don't talk about it. You need to deal with it. Things that have happened to you, you need to deal with it. Maybe it's going to the doctor. Maybe it's starting a diet. Maybe it's going to rehab. Maybe it's admitting to your friends and family that you need help. They already know you need it. You're the only one in denial. Just tell them. They tell them. When you finally decide you've had enough and you're tired of stagnation and you're tired of not growing and you want to be fruitful in your life, you're going to have to go into that closet where you've been putting everything... That and God is so, and you're going to have to pull it out one by one. And God is so gracious that if you will begin to work on it, he will bless your efforts, and it won't take you near as much time to fix it as it took you to screw it up. But God will never fix what you won't face. If you won't face it, he's not going to fix it. He's going to require you to deal with it. So for some of you, it's not just about effort. It's about specifically dealing with those stinky places, those deep, dark, hurtful places in your life. So maybe you got to dig it, maybe you got to dung it, but let's talk about the last one. For some of you, it's not about more effort. You've been putting in the effort. For some of you, it's not about digging deep into those stinky places of your life. You've sat on couches and talked it out. You've gone to dinners and cried and had three-hour sit-downs with mom and dad and confessed. And you've been, like, you've tried all that stuff. For some of you in the room, it's time to cut it. It's time to cut it. The last thing the servant said to the master was, if after digging about it and after adding fertilizer... It doesn't grow, well, cut it. And this is the most painful part of the growth process because there, there, because there comes this point in life when you know something needs to be cut, but it's so hard to do. And you know that God is, is challenging you and convicting you, and you know, you know what you need to do, but it's so hard to pull the trigger. And God is not convicting you, challenging you, nudging you to cut something because he's mean. He's challenging you because he wants to take you to a new place. But you can't take old things to new places. Right? 
And he's trying to take you somewhere. Years you today have been dragging something around with you for years. Maybe since childhood or, or high school. And it is like an anchor that will not let you move forward. It's keeping you stuck. And God wants to do new things in your life, but he almost requires you to cut old things to make room for new things. Almost always. Maybe it's relationships. This is the hardest area to cut, isn't it? I mean, when I talk about relationships, you guys will talk to me afterward and you'll say, Jason, I really want to, but they've been my best friends since middle school, man. Jason, I know I need to get out of this relationship and I know we're not married, but we've been together like nine years and we got like three kids together. We're like living together. You want me to just cut it? How do I do that? All right. Maybe it's relationships. Nothing determines the trajectory of your life like your relationships. That's just a fact. That is a fact that you will be the average of your five closest friends. So you may have one or two great friends, but if you got one or two that are always being stupid, getting arrested, driving drunk, selling drugs, guess what's happening to the average, right? And you're gonna be the average of your five closest friends. And so you know, like right now as I'm talking, like you know. You know who you need to cut. Like, man, that sounds mean, Jason. No, it's for you. It's for your good. It's for your good. And, and that person, whether it's a friend or a boyfriend or a girlfriend, is you're afraid to make a move from God's best for your life. You're afraid to make a move, but the Holy Spirit today is telling you, cut it. Cut it. Some, some, some of you have habits, right? You've been doing some things for so long you can't imagine not doing them. And I'm not even talking necessarily like drugs and substances, even though that could very well be the case. But for others of you, like it's just some habits in your life and it's just you've been doing them and doing them and doing them. You don't even know how to have life without those things. It's time to cut it. Because those actions, those habits are keeping your life from being fruitful. We could give example after example. The fact is that Jesus modeled it for us. You got to curse the barren fig trees in your life. You got to curse the barren fig trees in your life. You got to let it die. So what do you need to do? What do you need to do? You need to dig? You need to dung? You need to cut? What is your response to God's word today? What do you need to do? Let's pray.